cancer, 140 men will die every time 100, 100 women dies from cancer, and so on and so forth. You see in every of, of these diseases, you see that, that, that men has the men-woman ratio is much above one. So we have this paradox that men actually live shorter and have more diseases, more bad health, but they think their health is much better. So that's, when I take this in, I think it's, it's interesting because normally when, when people evaluate about their own mental health, we'll say, well, then that's how they are. That we, we could count on when they say they have a good uh, mental health, they are actually healthy mentally. But I think what we can see from, from the, the uh, somatic area might be applied to the mental health area. That is my claim here, that, that although men think and evaluate their own mental health much better than women do, and a lot of the figures we'll see seems to, to uh, say that, that uh, men's uh, mental health is much better than women's, then we could, and we can discuss it of course, it seems that actually a lot of men's mental health problems are not detected and therefore also not treated. So, so that is, is uh, uh, my starting point here. Another way to look at it is, is when you ask men to evaluate their own health during lifetime, you'll see here that when you came to come to the, this is some interviews one of my colleagues do every half year, they ask the men how, how do you evaluate your own health? Is it good, bad, or very good? And you can see here that the men that are 98, 90 years old or, or older, they, they actually say that 60% of them find their own health very good or good. But the guys who make these interviews, he normally says, when I come next time, they're probably dead. But the time before they said our, our health is good or very good, and then he also asks them, how would you evaluate your own health compared with all guys at your age? And then you will see that 99% of all the men being 90 years old or older says that their health is much better or better than any other guys at my age. So men's way of evaluating their own health is a very interesting thing and therefore it's very important to see what are men's own evaluations and what do the figures say and what can we learn and discuss about that. This guy here is maybe a good uh, example of how men look at risks and their own health and the dangers around them. This might be some plutonium outburst here or some bird flu <laughs> and the other persons here have evaluated the situation in just another way. And this guy, he, he is full of optimism and, and thinks no, nothing can go wrong. And I think that's a good picture of how men evaluate their, their own health uh, and risks in, in, in their health. So when we go further into these figures and see that how, how many men and women evaluate their own mental health as bad, then you'll see 12.5% women and seven around 7.5% men evaluate their own health as bad. And that's where we are going, coming closer to, to the real uh, mental disturbances, because that is very close to what we see in statistics. When we look at, at uh, who has been referred to hospitals and psychiatrists with, with uh, mental health problems, you'll see there are very big differences among the different diagnoses for men and women. I'm, I'm sorry I'm moving all the time, no, so right. you have all this work. <laughs> uh, so, so you'll see here that when we look at depression, which is the biggest mental health problem we have, you see there's something about uh, nearly double as many women as men being referred to hospitals and psychiatrists with depression. So that might be just what they actually said about their own health because there was nearly double as many women as men saying that their health was bad. So, so that is, is what I'm, I'm going to confront here. When you look around in Europe, and this is from our, our big report, you'll see that in all countries we have the same features, although the difference in when you are diagnosed with a, with a depression is very, very different. You'll see from 
Poland to Finland and, and Austria, there are very big differences in when you are diagnosed with the depression. But in all countries, no matter what criteria they use for giving you the diagnosis, there's always double as many women as men getting the diagnosis. So this might, might tell us that it actually is so all the time there are, no matter how you define a depression, there's always double as many women as men having a depression. But, but I, I think it's not like that. <coughs> and um, a very interesting study actually uh, made, gave some very big questions, at least, to this picture. It was from the Swedish island Gotland. Nobody of you would know it, but if you guess, you would. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody else will know it. But it's, it's a small, nice uh, island with some 25, 50,000 people. And they had a high rate of suicide at, at this island. So uh, they made a program there, a program that should detect depression very early uh, among people. And it was the general practitioners who should uh, find depression very early among the people there. So they were educated in how to detect depression very early. Because they, everybody knows that depression and suicide is very close related. So it was, went very well, actually. Uh, after some years, they evaluated the project and found out that around it, it was a success in that way that uh, uh, suicide rate fall very dramatically, but only among women. Men's, men's suicide were unattached. Right? Un nothing happened with men's suicide. So. It was a good idea to detect depression early at the GPs, but not for men. So this was an eye-opener into what, what is it about uh, men and, first of all, how do men perceive their own problems? When do they see, when they have a problem, when do they see there's a uh, mental problem, a psychological problem, when do they say that how I feel is a mental problem? The next thing is, if they actually think they have a mental problem, how often would they use the G go to the GP when, when, when they felt like that? The third thing is, how good are the health services here, the GPs, to find out if men actually have a mental problem? And the last thing was that it seems that many of the men who actually went to the GP and afterwards committed suicide, they had shown some symptoms that, that uh, the, the doctors didn't see as if they had a problem. Rather, they came to the doctor smelling of alcohol at 9 o'clock in the morning and they were angry and they were irritating and they were in everything, have a, a challenging behaviors. So the doctors just got them out of their, 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 their place again. So that was some of the things that opened the eyes for that when we look at men's mental problems, we have to have new ways to look at it. And, and behind that, because a lot of the problems that they saw the men was saw among the men was they they had alcohol problems, but they were not seen as men with depressions. And many of those men who had alcohol. Uh, abuse, substance abuse, mostly alcohol, actually committed suicide. But the question was, were they not depressed? So if we look at the figures here again, and looking at how, how is it with depression in all the European countries, double as many women uh, as men uh, are diagnosed and treated for a depression. But when you look at substance abuse, you see around a mirroring of those figures. So that double as many men as women are diagnosed with having a diagnosis for substance abuse. And if you actually put those two figures together, you see that in all the country it nearly is a mirroring of the situation. So that double as many men ha having a, a substance abuse diagnosis and double as many women as men has a depression uh, diagnosis. But the question is, those men who has this diagnosis, don't they have depressions? And another question is, how about the women having depression?
crisis, don't they have substance abuse problems? Probably they have. So I think one of the things we could take on, well, we need to say that, of course it is so that we know that a lot of men, are, most men are binge drinking, and we know that, that uh, there are kinds of uh, abuse also, uh, but, but in all those kind of abuse, actually, it seems to be men that are diagnosed for it. So I think that we should say that, or my claim is that men are more easily diagnosed on the basis of something they do, a behavior, while women are more often or rather uh, diagnosed on the basis of how they feel. And depression is something you feel, while substance abuse is something you do. So, so in, in that way, a lot of men's depressions are under-detected and also then under-treated. Of course there are many men then in treatment for substance abuse, but they just primarily focusing on the abuse, on the, the behavior, and not on how men feel. So that is the, the, the first claim. The second one is about men's presentation of symptoms, which is also something coming out of the, the Gotland uh, studies. Uh, where we found that men showed some other kind of, of uh, uh, symptoms. First of all, when we look at all the scales for what is a depression, the ICDT, which is uh, WHO's uh, criteria which we use in Europe, uh, you see every, every time depression is something about uh, low self-confidence, poor increase, appetite, persistent sadness, or low mood, it's always something inwards. All, all the way, de all, all the ways depression are, are defined, all the criteria for depression is something inward, something I hate myself, I feel I'm being punished, I feel guilty all the time. So in all the ways, all the symptoms that are, are defining what is <coughs> depression, you'll see this is the Hamilton scale, this is a clinical scale. Again, feelings of guilt, agitation maybe, but mostly anxiety depressed mood, sadness, hopelessness, and so forth. So, when we look at what, what, is, what, what is the definition of a depression, it is actually the one thing you, feelings you turn inward, feelings of being, uh, blaming yourself, feeling tired, loss of concentration, hopelessness, helplessness. So, so uh, the question is then, what about guys like those? What do they feel? Well, we know how they act, we know their behavior. <coughs> but in the Gotland study, they found out that a very important thing from all the patients there was that men often, first of all, showed outward symptoms. Those men who later on committed suicide. They showed acting out, aggressiveness, low impulse control, <coughs> restlessness, low stress threshold, and so on. And, and uh, when, when you look, look at, at patients actually having a, a depression uh, diagnosis or in treatment for depression, you would see that it is double as many men who show this uh, anger, have these anger attacks when they are actually depressed in, in the, the uh, traditional way of defining it. And when you look at how, how many, how often men or women show these <coughs> anger attacks, it's three times as many men as women showing that. So it seems to be related much more to men's way of being depressed that they have anger attacks, that they have substance abuse, that they have a lot of all these things that were found there. Another uh, way of looking at it, which has mostly been seen actually in the American uh, gender or men's studies, psychology studies, is what we could call the withdrawal reactions or the withdrawal symptoms, that when you see men feeling bad, feeling sad, being depressed, they very often withdraw from their close relations. That's something I find very often uh, many of my male patients have when I uh, have them in therapy, they very often talk about could I just be left alone, could I just be at peace for some time, could I just be free of all the relations, all the things that everybody wants from me, then I would feel better. So many of the men with depression have thought of, 
that if they were not close to other people, they would feel better. Many of them are very withdrawn from other people, but still they, they have the thought that could I just be left alone, then everything would be better. And that's very interesting and, and very sad because both the, the acting out symptoms and the withdrawal symptoms takes men further away from getting help, actually. Because when you can't see your close relations as a resource when you're, you're feeling sad, but seeing them as one more problem, and when you're acting out or even uh, having a substance abuse problem, you push people further away from you and you get further away from getting help. So because of these symptoms, a lot of men won't be diagnosed for depression, but they would also get further away from getting help from other people, both their, their nearest ones and the, the, the health services. So I think it's reasonable to say that depressed men with acting out, substance abuse and or withdrawal symptoms are less easily detected and are often not treated for their mental health problems. The next thing is, is, is men and suicide, because that is a really, really interesting thing, because when we talk about depression and suicide, it's normal to say that the more depression, the more suicide, and that's how it is. But only when you look at the one gender and the other gender, when, but when you look at men, yeah, when there is more depression, there are more suicide. When you look at women, yes, when there is more depression, then there, is more, there are more suicides. But when you look at, at the genders together, you see that a lot of men, more, uh, men commit suicide than women. Also in the different countries, although, and this is not uh, very, uh, it's not very evidence-based, because this is what these, the different countries <coughs> report about suicides, and, and countries don't even doesn't always want to, to report suicide. But in every country you see that the, the men-women ratio are nearly the same. Three to five times as many men as women commit suicide. And, and in some countries it's, it's even more. But again, when, when you compare the depression and the, the uh, suicide figures, you see again a mirroring. And that is very strange because as women has, have more depressions, you should think they had more suicides, but it's, it's the opposite. So that is a, a, a place where, you, in my opinion, you see that a lot of the men's depressions are hidden among these, uh, so, uh, behind these suicides. And one important thing is that when you look at suicide and age, you see that men's suicide are going up and up and up uh, through the ages, while if you see women's suicide are nearly the same all through the years from around 40, the age of 40 and onwards women's suicide are on the same level. This is figures for the whole of Europe, but you will see that men's suicide grow and grow and grow and, and when you come to men ab about 80 years, they have four to five times as many suicides than women. So somewhere here you will see you see a lot of men's older men's depressions that are not detected and not treated and the re as a result of that you will see so many suicides uh, among the older men and then we of course know that, that there is a lot of more suicide attempts among especially young women so on the right figure you will see the, the suicide attempts among young women and they are falling down and men have some uh, suicide attempts also, but on the other hand you have the, the suicides among men, and there's lots, lots more suicide attempts than, than suicide. But if you compare the, 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 the thing, I, I would say that suicide attempts might be a cry for help, and the hope that there might be some kind of help to get, while men's suicides um, are made because the men want to die, and they don't think there is any help to get and they have given up to find any help. So that is also, you should say, a picture of how, how men's depressions 
are not detected and are not uh, and men are not getting the help. So the, the much higher numbers of suicide in men are among other things due to lack of detection of depressions among men. The next thing is is men and, and using and men's lack of using help services. When you, you look at, at, at this picture which counts uh, the, the men, women, it's very difficult to understand, but the thing is that the, the blue dots here show how many men and women go to the uh, general practitioner. And every time the dot is above one, there are more women than men going to the GP. And all through life in the European countries, and I think also in, in, in the United States, women go 30% more often to the GP than men do. And the GP is actually the way to get mental health, in Denmark at least, you go to the GP and get the mental health uh, services uh, that way, and because it's free, most of it. So I think men very often comes too late to the doctor, and uh, we know that it's very often their wives who send them when they go to the and they can come up to the doctor. And actually, there was a GP who told me that came this man up to his clinic and said, well, my wife said I should come. Okay, says the doctor, what, what, what is it about? And then the man suddenly became very uh, looking bewildered and said, could I just use your phone for a minute? <laughs> That's a real story. So he, he didn't know what it was about, but that's actually... Uh, a thing that is, is happening because when you when you go uh, uh, the research we, we made last year was asking GPs think about your last patient who was 40 years or older and who diagnosed with depression was that patient a man or a woman and it's three times as many times they say it was a woman than it was a man so this is more seldom that they actually find depressions among their patients that is diagnosed in the society, so the GPs is a problem, and, and that is the way in the Nordic country to get uh, a diagnosis and, and getting help. And if you look at, we have a, a system in Denmark where you can have psychological help, also for depression, if you are referred to it uh, by your, your uh, GP. And if you look at this, you can see how many men and women actually are referred to a psychologist. Then it is three times more often uh, women are referred to. So that could mean that, that women actually have more mental problems or, again, that men's mental problems are not detected. So I think it's important to say that men's less use of health services and less treatment for men with mental problems are due to problems with detecting men's sufferings, with communication with men and with lack of appropriate treatment services for men. So that is a place where you, you could act if you want to, to change the situation. And the last area I go into is uh, men and postpartum depressions because that is a, a new thing and, and it is not recognized very many places in the, in the world. Actually, I, I don't know, but it's a few years ago it was recognized officially in the health services in Denmark that men can actually get postpartum depression. But when we talk about it, the first time in the year 2002, it was actually a joke. It was in many newspapers and there were drawings, funny drawings, cartoons about men crying with a, looking like a baby or things like that. So everybody made a laugh of that men could get postpartum depression. We were laughed at. But at the same time, you know, a lot of men actually came to our clinic and have come there since and saying, yes, that is exactly what I, I have ex experienced here. So, when, when we found out that men could get these problems too by a big project where we were interviewing a lot of men who were becoming fast and ha having been fast, uh, we, we got the possibility from a grant from the EU to see how, how many men do actually have this problem. Normally we're talking about, and that's really accepted to say that among from 10 to 14 percent of all women having a child will have a postpartum depression. So how many men would have that? And when we made this research we 
learned from the Gotland experience, saying that we would both look into the traditional, seeing how many men have the traditional uh, depression symptoms, but also how many men would have the male depression symptoms. So we used the, the, the traditional depression scales, which is about feeling low, feeling unhappy, feeling sad, and feeling blaming yourself and things like that. And then the, the scale that was developed from the, the Gotland studies, which is not perfect in any way, but it's actually looking into how, how, how many of, of the men will have these upward uh, symptoms and, and uh, substance abuse symptoms and things like that. So, so we used that and, and found out actually that, that about 67% men actually have a, a postpartum depression. And, and uh, we used these two scales and we found out that most of the men would be detected by the normal and traditional depression scales. Everybody ab uh, above this line here would have the traditional uh, mental health uh, depression symptoms. And, and everybody on the right side of this line would have the, the male depression symptoms also. And a lot of them were caught by both of the scales, but there are some men, there are many men in, in every part here, but a lot of the men would only be detected by the male depression scale, the Gotland depression scale. So that's why we, we use that now in, in Denmark actually. In, in, in <coughs> actually right now there are thousands and thousands of, of uh, families where, where they have a child that are screened with both the, the traditional depression scales and both fathers and mothers would be screened with both scales here in Copenhagen and a lot of our uh, <coughs> So that was, has come out of this, but it is saying that this has not been uh, acknowledged before. And if we just look at, at the figures in the United States, you say there are around 4 million annual births in the United States, around 275,000 men would suffer in the United States from postpartum depressions. And, and there's a, a study actually in the United States, uh, meters analysis showing that maybe it's about 10% of all fathers would have a, a postpartum depression. So that would be 400,000 men in the United States. How many of them do you think are detected for a postpartum depression? How many men do you think are treated for it or getting help for it? Maybe not so many. So I think that, and what we know is actually, that two big studies have shown that men's postpartum depression <coughs> also, you can see that in their children's behavior and mood uh, states later on in life when you look at them in, in kindergarten and you look at them in school. So it has effects also fathers postpartum depressions on the child's development, so it's not uh, a small thing actually. So, another thing which I think is interesting is that, that when we have and speak with these men in, in our psychotherapies, we find very often this withdrawal uh, reactions among the men. Very often they find that being together with their wife and their child is the worst thing they, they can have in this. Many of the men I, I, I talk to find that the cry, baby crying is the worst thing they, they can feel in the world and they try to convince me that they have some special things in their ears that, that does it. It's, they cannot stand and be together with the children they love and when they get better it suddenly disappears. Yeah. Do you think this is about socialization or is there some uh, you know, natural situation that causes them to do this one? I think it's socialization because 93% of the men who get a child doesn't have this. So then it's a variation at least in <laughs> the No, I, I think it is, is a way of the men not being able to, for a lot of reasons, to, to uh, feel anything but themselves in this situation. That's what I'm working with them. When they all the time say, well, I can't stand the crying, then I say, you should all the time go say, 
why does she say it? Why does she cry? What does she need? So that's what I, I train them to, to try to think of when they do it, actually. You know, this genetic thing goes away. <laughs> but it is a way of reacting. Everybody knows that it is. Baby crying is some of the things that goes most hot into your nervous system of all things in the world. So, of course, there is a biological basis for, for feeling like this, of course. We also see when they talk about how their relations are with their own parents that we don't know anything about how their childhood was. But now when they feel like they do now, they talk about feeling being abandoned by their parents. They think it's very difficult with relations and with their uh, child in general. They have maybe problems in, in the couple and marriage uh, with that child and a lot of regressions around the wives. They have anger and quickly getting away from pain. That is very many men seems to, to react in ways where they it's difficult for them to, to, to be in a situation where they feel pain of some kind and then they are reacting with anger or are they, they are <coughs> running away in, in different ways. And then there's also things about what is it to be a man, when, when how, how can I be a natural or how can I be caring at the same time and, and, and being a man uh, like I thought I should be. Yeah. So, I, so should I, um, can we assume that this is usually for the first child or it depends upon the, it depends on how much the baby cries. Maybe like the fourth one is crying a lot and then maybe he was okay with the yeah, first yeah. three, but then, or, I, I think especially the last one here, like being a father. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Well, 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 you know, we have some home nurses coming in 99% of all families in Denmark. And, and when I work together with them, they normally say that this child is not crying very much. The child that the man thinks cries all the time. So, so I, I think it is the relation that is it's a difficult relation. And when we talk about this, crying is one of the easiest things to, to put words on, so to speak. So, this is one of the things we... I made just a small study of the anger in this, of anger in this men, where I, I looked into records from, from uh, around 170 men with pre- and postpartum depressions. And many of the texts I used were emailed from the men, because uh, many of my therapy starts with the men sending me emails where they tell me about what is the problem. So I have a lot of written uh, material from, from those men, which I, I go into and have, have analyzed. And, and it was when they were in, afterwards, when, when they had been in the treatment, I looked into it. And we found here that of, of the men with postpartum depression, we found in one third, around one third, there were anger of different kind of different levels, but where they were expressed anger. And then very often I'm asked, is it dangerous? that they have this anger. And normally it is very, very seldom. It is, you can see only 2% of all the men with postpartum depression actually had shown any form of anger, and only very mild anger. Only one man of all the 170 that had actually uh, been violent, and he was sent to me from the police. So, so this was a case different from all the other ones. In all the other ones, there has been no uh, actual uh, violence, but, but in those three cases you could count some kind of, uh, two of them sh throwing some uh, there in Sulte, no. No. after the child and something else, uh, putting it hard on, on the bed, that was the two things, and then there was the third thing. So I think it's important to say that there is a lot of anger, but normally it is not <coughs> dangerous at all, and normally it will not lead to any kind of violence, but actually most of the men feel really bad that they have these feelings of anger. So you could say that anger is frequently occurring in the men with postpartum depressions. Actually a lot of women 
also has some anger. My, my PhD was about women and postpartum depression, so I have studied that also. <laughs> just, just to tell you that. So the number of cases is around 2% of anger. Yes, I'm going to so the claim here is that men's postpartum depressions, which are not uh, detected because they are not recognized as uh, uh, something that exists, are hiding a lot of the, the, the numbers of men with depressions that are not counted for in, in all the statistics. So I think when I've looked into all this and I've had all this psychotherapy is with men, I think that one big issue is in many of the men that when they feel bad, when they are depressed, there is some uh, ambivalence in them between the longing for closeness, attachment, and caring and caregiving on the one side, and then their want to be free, want autonomy, want in control, and that's something, of course, that is in everybody. There is a difference between that and there's some ambivalences, maybe in all of us, but it is very, very strong in men with mental problems, with depressions, and it's something we always have to talk about. And an and, 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 and idea for me is that maybe it is rather essential in masculine psychology for many men to being uh, ambivalent about how much would I invest in being together, how much do I like to be together, how close would I be to other people, to my my wife and my children, and longing for freedom, longing for getting away, longing for not being controlled and things like that. A lot of times when I have talked about this, not to people with mental problems, but normal men, a lot of them says, well this is how I feel, I have felt all my life. <laughs> so it is maybe something that exists more strongly in many men. And this is really a problem that grows and the ambivalence becomes stronger when you have mental problems, especially when you have problems around being around fatherhood and, and being related to a child. So concluding I would say that, that maybe we should think that not double as many men as women suffer from depression but that half of the men with depressions are not detected because of all the, the things I have claimed here. So if you look in the United States, approximately 15 million adults in the US is known to have a depression. And this will be 10 million women and 5 million men. So my claim would be that maybe 5 million of the men with depression in the United States are not detected and not treated if this thing is also uh, right in, in, in the United States. And just to look at what are the consequences of this, consequences of this, when you look at how much shorter a life people with mental illnesses have than other people, you see a, a new study that <coughs> just came last year in Denmark showing that men with mental uh, problems live 20 years shorter than the rest of the population of men. And for women it's 10 years short, so it's a double for men looking at expected lifetime for 15 years. So having a mental problem is not only mental, it's very much about life expectancy. So men with mental problems live 20 years shorter than the general population of men. So there are good reasons for, for, for doing something about this. And I think it's important to find ways to detect this 50% of men that are not known or getting help for their mental problems. I think it's important to look into the special symptoms of men or symptoms that you'll see more often in men because what we actually find out right now in our research is that there are also a lot of women showing these symptoms. Not as many as men, but a lot of them showing these symptoms that are not counted for and are not detected as, as women with depression. So actually we can bring something for the women too with, with these studies. And I think it's very important to find better, uh, to find ways to better prevent 
men's suicide, especially this very, very high number of, of uh, suicide amongst uh, aged men. Then, of course, we have done that in Denmark, but it's only on, on paper because there's a lot of work to do in acknowledging men's parts of depression online with the same level as women, and then maybe find treatment models better suited for men. I don't know if, if, if we should think about better ways to, to treat men with psychotherapy or other ways of, of treatment, but, but that's a question you could have. My own experience is that as soon as the men come to the therapy, they stay there as long as women do and they have exactly the same out of it as women do. So maybe the big thing is how to get men to the places where they have this and, and as soon as they are there, they will benefit from it. So that is what we are working very much uh, with uh, in Denmark. So that is the last things I would say. This is some of the literature behind what I've been talking about. And thank you for listening to me. In 2002, when you first introduced the idea of postpartum depression yeah, yeah. and made people laugh, yeah. as time moved on, did the public at large start to accept the idea of postpartum depression? Now they have. Yeah. Now they have. It's very normal that there are newspaper articles about so and so many men that postpartum depression, veterans having uh, postpartum depression. Uh, that's an easy way to go and get things popular to talk about veterans, actually. And, and, uh, but, but it is rather accepted now, I, I would say. So a lot of municipalities around in Denmark ask me, to, can we use your screening instruments for both the father and the mother? So, so that is a success, I would say. <laughs> yes? Oh, so, well, well, thank you so much. That was like, very, very interesting. And uh, I mean, I have like, a, a few questions. The first one is just like, very quickly. So I assume that like, when we talk about like, suicide, like, uh, I think like, for the man who has uh, who have postpartum depression, I feel like suicide is a, probably it's not very common, I assume, right? It's usually for the aged man. So uh, when it comes to them, for some reason, they, even though they don't get any treatment, uh, I think they kind of like heal themselves, right? Just, you know, with the kids and family. So then I was wondering, like, when it comes to the aged man, so do we know uh, about like um, their religious affairs and then their like uh, marital status? So then, I mean, when they are, are they usually like divorced or are they just abandoned by their kids? I mean, uh, is, is, would it be a reason? I mean, for their you know the older men you're talking about for the older men and also like for the women. I was wondering like menopause would be like one cause that they feel depressed, but mm. then they d later they just, you know, get the sore mm. and then they live longer. So, uh, I don't know if... No, no. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a big question, so I'll, I'll just start where I think it could start. A very interesting thing is when, when you look at who is in risk after having lost your spouse, oh. and how long time are you at risk. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the figures and say that in the first six months, mm -hmm. both men and women I'm very high at risk of committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Very soon after, the women's risks are zero. Mm -hmm. Very sad. Because the men's suicide risk will be rather high through the next three or four years. So women get over it, mm -hmm. but men's risk of suicide will last longer. And that is very interesting, I think, because when, when we ask the men in Denmark, how much do you think family life means to you and ask the women? A lot of more men think that family life is important than women do. And that is a whole new thing because if you went look back in the 50s, women were dependent on being married as the only way to, 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 to live nearly. But right now it is so that less women are dependent or, or what you would say want marriage. So, we have a lot of single men in the older age who are divorced. Actually, if you look into how much shorter would a single man live than a married man, it's seven years. 
you lose seven years of your life expectancy by being simple, either divorced or unmarried or a widow. While for women it's only around three years. Very sad. Is it because global that women have women are like talkative and then they are open to share their feelings with their friends, but men are not. So I was wondering if like, you know, they're being like talkative is helping them to get this over like this whole yeah, I think Yeah, that's one thing. But I also think that a lot of women because of the way of living having much closer social networks mm -hmm. while men are often very close connected with their, 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 their working life. Mm -hmm. And when they come out of the working life, they have very few, unless they engage in a lot of mm -hmm. other things, maybe religious, maybe sports, maybe, but, but very many men have a very smaller social network when they get old. And if they lose their wife, they are very, very lonely very often. And that is the, the, the main thing it is to talk about the older men's loneliness and isolation. That, that I think it's very important. Yes? Um, <clears throat> when I was pursuing an undergraduate in psychology, it was explained in our psychology of aging class that um, if, if a man loses his wife, his wife was perhaps socialized to be the one who was more actively engaged in the social and family connections actively, you know, staying in touch. And so once she is no longer there, he then loses that um, conduit to relationships that may still be there, but perhaps he hasn't developed the type of rapport with them to be able to um, be more active in maintaining those relationships. Um, but I just, I, I wondered a few years back why I always felt so much sadder when looking at a you know very elderly man sitting by himself than a really elderly woman. And I, I thought about it quite in depth and I, I came to the conclusion that I assume that elderly men are struggling more than elderly women because they used to be perceived as so powerful and strong and, you know, respected for whatever status they had achieved through the typical masculine rubric upheld by society. And once you physically can no longer deny, even though it sounds like they deny it as long as they can, you know, as long as you cannot deny any longer that you are getting weaker, that you are getting sick, that you are getting old, and you're perceived by others as being that, um, that partially due to our ageism, partially due to our stereotypes about genders, that men actually fare far worse than women in the status differential that suddenly they experience. Whereas women are typically used to being perceived as perhaps weak and ineffectual and then having to prove otherwise. And, you know, I observe this on the subway when older men really insist that they do not want the seat someone is trying to offer them, and the person insists, and the older man looks very unhappy about finally accepting, because they're being forced into a performance of weakness, much like when, you know, the girl has to sit if the seat is empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least we, we know that, that uh, when, when we have looked into a lot of suicide letters from older men, mm -hmm. they very often talk about the reason being the loss of, of their, their wife, but also having a, a, a illness, mm -hmm. a disease of some kind, and then they think it's finished, and then they commit suicide, or, or loss of, of uh, being able to do things, maybe not being able to drive cars anymore, or things like that. So it's very more often loss of something they could do. Mm -hmm. if, if this is also, I, I think I would maybe say it's, it's more than just the masculine identity that they, that they are given. It's also uh, loss of freedom. Mm -hmm. It's also loss of being able to do things that, that uh, makes them feel well. I think a lot of men likes to drive cars and, and they, it's just some kind of mental therapy for many men going out driving in their car and then when they can't do these things they don't know where to go. So of course you're right in many of the things you said about what, what is it about men's masculinity or the image of masculinity or things like that. 
but it's also the loss of something which has been good for men to do. And I think that's, that's an important thing to bring into. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to take away from the, you know, the, 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 the problem with male suicide, and I think that's why mm -hmm. it's something that when first time people hear about it, they're very shocked because they mm -hmm. just sort of think women commit suicides. They don't, I don't think they're, they're, they're I think people are surprised by the statistic. Um, but I, I, I have to question whether suicide always equals depression. And again, when we're talking about, about, about age, you know, mm -hmm. when, in, a, in the case of, you know, a terminal disease, is it, can it be more about control? Which, again, maybe, again, I, I, I guess I'm just not mm -hmm. sure whether I would, and maybe again there's a problem with feeling you have to be in control, um, but I, I'm not sure if in all those situations, I, and maybe, again, and again, that have more of a, the, the control is the issue, rather than necessarily depression. Yeah. It's, it's something we always discuss, and that's why I said, among other things, okay. meant suicide uh, is, is due to lack of detected depressions. Because it's also a, an existentialistic mm -hmm. question, could you just commit suicide because you want to and there's nothing else wrong? Some people think like that. Uh, maybe I would say, well, if, if you're not able to see the possibilities that actually are there, that is a problem you have that we might be able to help you with, and then it was not necessary, but it is really difficult to say. So I, I would say, among other things, it's among because, other things is the way to okay. yeah, That's your phrase. because it's really a, yeah, mm -hmm. philosophical discussion. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I was, you, I think you were the first. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could expand on the non-postpartum depression, so just general depression, anger attacks, mm -hmm. so things that men do, not things mm -hmm. that men feel. Um, in any of in any of those cases, is it all just self-reported, I was angry, or I felt angry, or is it actually, I yelled at someone, or I threw something, or I punched a wall, or... Do you, so like what, in the general depression category, yeah, yeah, not yeah, the yeah, postpartum, yeah, yeah. was it violence more than anger, or still just anger without the violence? It is description of having done something in anger, actually. Okay. I just took my car and drove away too fast, you know. Yeah. It is, I was just so pissed off on, on her and I just sat there and, you know, that, that kind of thing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I was thinking about the proportion of depression. Like, uh, can you tell the difference between female and male uh, GPs would like, I guess they're, they're the ones to like detect mm -hmm. symptoms mm -hmm. and even though you change mm -hmm. the scale of detecting mm -hmm. symptoms, like there must be some kind of cultural bias or like different expectations maybe, like, or do you know anything about that? Yeah, yeah, actually because I'm, I'm, I'm teaching all the time the, the, the female GPs because they are taking over these years, you know, all the male GPs they're going on pension and then there's a lot of new female GPs taking on they are the majority in, the, in a few years and, and they are actually wanting to be uh, taught about how, how to handle all my male patients and among that um, the, the uh, depression uh, symptoms and things like that but we don't see any difference in the detection of depression among if it's a male doctor or female doctor, no. but women want to learn more. But also the other way around, like, I, I, it could also be like men would react differently towards a female doctor, like, yeah. Yeah. being yeah. less able mm -hmm. to, exp or don't want to look, like, yeah. Yeah. I had a weird discussion with my dad the other day because he didn't understand how his uh, diabetes, the diabetes nurse that is helping him with his diet, he had told him or something about her being beautiful and something like that, mm -hmm. which is a pretty stupid comment to <laughs> in that situation, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she reacted awkwardly, yeah. and he didn't understand that. He was just joking around. But, yeah, 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 yeah. but like those kind of situations, yeah. there would be some kind of There's gender tension or whatever. A lot, a lot of that. And, and actually, we, we, you know, we, we have, these years in Denmark at least, we have to say, well, 
the health system is a female system. All the nurses, nearly all the doctors now, when you start, 60% of all uh, new candidates as, as doctors are actually women. So it's when a man is a patient, he's going to meet female uh, professionals. So that's we can't change that as far as we can see. So we, we make a lot of courses for the, especially female doctors and and the nurses, which are only women, uh, about communicating with me. And this is a really good example, which I will bring in how to deal with that. Because that is very typical, actually, that, that in, in some of those situations when there is a communication, the men starts another place than the women do, and, and, and uh, how to make the meet is all around important things. That, that's what we actually do. Also, male patients with anger is, is something that we do a lot. Both when they say like your father says and then when they are angry with the professionals. That is very important actually. I hear in the U.S. there's been a shift in the number of women in colleges. You know, some colleges is 65% of the population. So, like you mentioned, 60% of female um, doctors. Is the same thing going on in Europe, and does that impact how men are, um, you know, dealing with the fact that there's an erosion of traditional male role models? Is that impacting suicide? Um, I hope not, but but I, I I wouldn't know any research saying anything about that. But, but I I think I'm rather optimistic in, in, in the way that I think that more of the female doctors actually want to bring gender up as, as, as a subject and, and, and the important thing to, to be aware of their own gender, their patient's gender and how can we deal with that. Men have never liked so much to be talked about as a gender. <laughs> so you know, when I talk about the word gender in, in the place where I work and all the male doctors sit there, they get you know, they, <laughs> and they don't know really what to do about it because they've never thought about themselves as a gender and, and that's more easy for women. And of course much more young men like these years are much more into it. But there's been a lot of studies, do, do, is, is a male psychologist, psychiatrist, doctor better for a man or a woman and, and I think nearly all the research that has been about it is when the patients actually answer the questions is that half of them say it's, it's no problem and half of them say it's, it's either I, I really like the one thing or the other. So there are no clear conclusions in any of the research I've seen about is, is what do we do about it. So, so my own conclusion is it's a question about uh, educating the professionals in thinking about gender thinking about their own gender, thinking about the patient's gender. Yeah. So you said that one of the things, one of the biggest things is <coughs> getting people to help in the first place, right? Yeah. So do you have any speculation about how we could improve that? Well, we, we have done some research and there is some research in, in Europe at least that first of all it seems that it's easier for men to get help if they get it related to their working place. Much more, for some reason, men find it very, very difficult to call a doctor. It seems the worst thing in the world to, to take telephone and, and say, can I get an appointment on Wednesday? It seems impossible. And that's not because men can't book things. They can't do that very easily, but, but getting to the doctor. So how, how could we have the health system come to men in our ways? And, and we know that in, in uh, working places, if they get health checks mentally or, or physically at the, the working places, men says yes to it nearly all the time. So that is one thing. The other thing that we know is, is that, that men uh, want to have uh, health uh, offers that you can get to right away and not going to wait for. And that's very expensive. but. If, if we, we ask the men, what would they like to have? So if, if you're in the streets say, well, you can come and have a health check here, a lot of men will queue up there and say, yes, I will. But if they have to call the doctor, it's very difficult for them. So how can we uh, do that in different ways? So the working place, 
no 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 waiting time and and then we are actually working in a big project right now which is going how to, how to come out to the more vulnerable men maybe men who are not at the working place the older men how can we create some kind of health offers for health services for them mentally as well as physically when when they are very you know have very weak uh, networks they know working places they have no colleagues around them often they are single so how, how could we get out to them and, and we have no conclusions on that or results on that but that's what we are working for the next four years in, in a big project actually so good ideas about how to come out to the men or how to recruit men for the actual services are we very welcome to. I would expect, that's just my speculation, that changing relations to children would actually also change men's reaction. Like the, this, the figure you showed with women between mm. 25 and 40, they had regular, really regular yeah, 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 appointments yeah. at the doctor, and that's probably related to the children as well. And I've been talking to some of the men that I interview about the thing about who's, who's taking the child to the doctor, mm. and actually they're really involved fathers and wives are busy, career women, so a lot of the time, the men take the child to mm. the doctor, mm. which is, they comment on that themselves as being yeah. something special, yeah. uh, because that's often a woman's thing to do. I think that and, is... And they actually, I think some of them actually say that that has also changed their own relation to the doctor, because yeah. because they go there, like, yeah. more often with the child, they know yeah. the doctor, and then it's yes. easier to... Well, but also, that's in right. relation to that, I was thinking about the thing with, with depression related to children, do you think... It's just because it hasn't been detected before, or do you think that the changed relation towards fatherhood also like, cause more yeah, 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 yeah. depression among fathers? Like, in, which, the causality, yeah, even though yeah, you yeah, don't yeah, like causality. Yeah, yeah. That is what we could call a good question, because uh, it's always raised, and I think we, we, we really don't know, because nobody did that research in 1951, so we wouldn't know. But my own opinion is that, yes, there has been a lot of men with that kind of reactions earlier on. And you have seen some descriptions, but, but you can't be sure. But I think there has been, there have been a lot of men have, having this problem. But at the same time, I think it's also true what you said, that when men came in closer contact with their infants, with their babies, then there will be more men who are hit by this. Problem. So I think it's it's both actually, but we, we wouldn't know because nobody would even in 1951 think that this should be something we should we should look into. The other thing about men, the young men being better when they become fast to use the health system, I think that's that's probably true, and we, we really hope that when they come down with their child and then they say, well, I also have this thing. Could I just ask you about this doctor? And think that. that, that's how women also have have used the doctors coming with their children and then having some extra questions about themselves. So that might be a way to educate women. Yeah. Okay, well, I think we will wrap things up. And of course, if people want to stay for informal discussion and have some cheese and hummus and things like that, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.